You are watching Notepad. My name is Ibrahim Sani. Um, as per usual, every now and then we talk about low carbon economy on this show. We talk about how uh, industries can actually optimize their energy efficiency and also talk about what the efforts are at industry level. And very, very soon, the Joint Committee on Climate Change, or JC3, will hold a flagship event on climate change. They want to call this Finance for Change. It's a virtual conference that will take place um, on the 23rd, 25th of June, and it will compile a very illustrious panel of speakers um, from the Deputy CEO of the uh, Securities Commission to the uh, Finance Minister himself, to Kuzafrul, uh, to the governor of Banagara to discuss and to try to alleviate the issue of how the finance sector in specific can actually argue for a better way of moving forward to achieve uh, global efficiency when it comes to energy. Uh, on my show this evening is Tan Sri uh, Abdul Wahid Omar, the Bursa chairman, uh, who has been kind enough to speak to us uh, halfway across the world uh, to talk about this issue. Uh, he will be also a speaker on JC3. Um, Tansri Wahid, thanks for gracing us with your presence uh, today. Now, of course, uh, you have been talking about um, energy efficiency. You've been talking about uh, low carbon economy for the longest of time. Even back when you were in Maybank, I remember succinctly uh, then uh, you were talking about this many years ago. Uh, and when you were helming the uh, uh, ministerial post, uh, you were also arguing for this as well. But that's the thing about um, uh, arguing about something, it's also trying to make it work as well. Uh, where do you stand on this issue of how climate change have been uh, uh, done, uh, particularly uh, in the finance sector? Well, thank you, Ibrahim, uh, for this opportunity. Now, I think it's very important for all of us to look at the big picture. And um, I would like to uh, zoom in on the upcoming uh, COP26 uh, that will, will be held in Glasgow in November. Now, this is uh, the conference of parties uh, that uh, will be making uh, three major commitments. One is the global movement towards net zero. Uh, secondly, is to half uh, net emissions by 2030. And the third uh, minimum objective is uh, to keep uh, global warming within one and a half degrees centigrade. Now, this is important for all of us um, who live uh, in this world, uh, because if we don't uh, strive hard enough, uh, there will be major consequences uh, to uh, the global environment. And uh, in this respect, uh, we have seen the entire global financial community uh, supporting uh, this uh, move uh, towards global net zero. And uh, this is being done, uh, among others, uh, by way of uh, accelerating our commitment towards uh, sustainable finance. Uh, and as you know, sustainable finance is about uh, taking into account the environmental, social, and governance uh, considerations uh, into um, our investment decision making and financing decision making, uh, and uh, moving towards uh, a more sustainable uh, growth uh, in the uh, economy and the well being of society. A lot of people think that sustainability is mostly talking about the environment, but people People tend to forget that uh, ESG, there's also the S and also the G um, element to it. Um, and of course, uh, while people want to argue that some industries uh, are harming the environment a lot more than, say, others, um, you know, for instance, uh, fossil fuel industry, oil and gas, uh, people would assume uh, that, uh, and rightfully so, that it would harm the environment a lot more, say, than, for instance, finance. But people want to talk about sustainable finance, the S element of it and the G element of it. Um, could you elaborate on that role where the finance sector is going to play when it comes to developing a climate change that is building not only a resilient economy moving forward post-pandemic, but perhaps sustainable as well? Well, um, maybe I can uh, share with uh, you the, some of the numbers. Uh, so uh, within the context of Malaysia, uh, if you look at uh, the contributors to carbon emissions, uh, 75% uh, is very much contributed by the energy and transport sector. So that's about 252 uh, metric tons of uh, carbon. Um, so out of 75% uh, of the total, uh, 335 uh, metric tons uh, contributed uh, by um, Malaysia uh, in the uh, overall uh, economy, if you like. Uh, so therefore, uh, naturally, uh, given that significant contribution from uh, the energy side, uh, you can't help uh, speaking about 
the uh, power generated from fossil fuels and so on. So that's something which uh, we'll, we will have uh, to deal with. Now, on the issue of the S and G, the, the, the social and governance, uh, social um, is more about uh, making sure that uh, you know, we uh, comply with human rights uh, practices uh, and especially in liberal policies uh, and the well-being of society. Um, and governance side, um, that refers a lot uh, with the way we conduct our business, especially uh, among the corporates, uh, among others, uh, making sure the uh, non-bribery practices uh, being put in place uh, and so on. Um, so on the financial institution side, um, uh, or sustainable investing, um, so maybe there are two elements there. Uh, one uh, is sustainable investing. The other one is uh, in terms of sustainable finance. Uh, by financial institutions. Uh, so mm. when investors uh, look at investing um, into equities, um, so they will be looking at investing in companies uh, that uh, take into account ESG considerations in their uh, business operations. Uh, and likewise, in the case of uh, banks, uh, so there's a global movement now, uh, making sure that uh, they will be net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, and uh, making sure that they don't finance um, projects uh, that bring harm to the uh, environment uh, and to the people. Uh, so, for example, uh, we have uh, many banks now committing not to finance any coal-related projects by 2030. Uh, so banks like HSBC and domestically Maybank, CIMB uh, and, and others have already made uh, those commitments. You know, uh, since its launch in 2014, um, the constituents, constituents of uh, FTSE for Good Bursa Malaysia Index have tripled uh, from 24 to 75. Um, what does this growth signify for the industry? Do you feel that this is going to bring about a significant change uh, to uh, bringing uh, sustainable finance uh, into the picture? Well, uh, thanks very much. We started with uh, screening uh, some 200 counters. Um, uh, and uh, making them uh, and testing them against uh, the compliance uh, with uh, ESG considerations, uh, working together with uh, FTSE uh, Russell, uh, if I may. Uh, and uh, when we started uh, back in uh, December 2014, uh, so you write that there were 24 uh, counters uh, that make up uh, that FTSE for Good Bruce Hamish Index. And Alhamdulillah, uh, through a lot of advocacy and engagement, uh, where more companies um, meet the criteria, uh, and now we have 75 uh, component uh, stocks uh, in the um, index. Now, obviously, uh, it is our hope uh, that uh, more and more companies uh, will uh, take ESG considerations into their business operations, uh, and therefore expanding uh, the list of, of the constituents, hopefully. You know, we talked about the SNG element uh, already, but I want to focus more as well uh, because governance has been brought into the spotlight. Uh, there's a lot of companies right now that are being uh, discussed, at least amongst the investors' uh, circle, on how they disclose information, uh, whether or not the information that's being disclosed is actually true and fair, whether the auditors and the assurance industry, so to speak, is coming out to say and alert people accordingly, uh, whether or not independent directors are rising up to the challenge of speaking up against uh, the board or against the management. All these things are happening right now. We just need to Google it and all the companies are out there uh, to be uh, 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 discussed. Uh, so now the question is from the Bursa perspective, uh, do you feel that uh, there is going to be a serious impact on how uh, listed companies are going to disclose moving forward, particularly in the context of Benegara's taxonomy on climate change and principle-based uh, taxonomy or the CCPT guidance. Do you think that this will help better disclosure? Do you think this will help better governance? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think we are seeing this on many fronts. I think firstly, firstly uh, the SE has really issued the uh, new uh, mission code on corporate governance, uh, which is uh, continu continually improving, if I may, and uh, upping the standards and, and, and the ante. Um, so uh, I think um, there are much stricter requirements in terms of ensuring uh, board diversity, uh, competence uh, and uh, independence. Um, and that's something uh, that uh, we lot and um, will be uh, further uh, promoting and enforcing it uh, if you like. Um, 
and uh, on uh, disclosure beyond the uh, statutory financial disclosure, um, I think um, all the additional movements, uh, for example, uh, in the case of the Financial Stability Board, uh, that's looking at the uh, task force for uh, climate-related um, financial disclosures, TCFD. Um, so that will uh, ensure um, financial institutions uh, report appropriately uh, on their exposures to uh, environmental considerations uh, and so on. Um, and obviously with the recent um, taxonomy um, being introduced by the central bank as well. So at the end of the day, uh, when we talk about financial reporting, uh, it will be uh, that integrated reporting uh, that will look at uh, things holistically. Now, one of the elements which um, uh, you know, I think deserves mentioning uh, is the uh, work done at the legislative level, if I may. So, so um, as you know, the MACC Act has been strengthened uh, with corporate liability uh, under Section 17A, uh, where um, corporates will now uh, have to bear responsibility for the actions taken by uh, their staff. Uh, who are involved in bribery activities and so on. So this is all part of the overall uh, movement towards uh, better governance, if I may. Uh, we'll go for one short break before we continue our conversation with Tansri Abdul Wahid Omar of Bursa Malaysia. Thanks for staying on with us. I have with us here uh, on the uh, line uh, Tan Sri Abdul Wahid Omar, uh, Bursa Chairman, as well as the WWF Malaysia Trustee. Uh, Tan Sri, earlier on you were talking about uh, COP26 Glasgow uh, that will take place uh, in November later on this year. Um, and it seems like the conversations that have been recorded by the press and by the uh, media, it's always about the G7 countries taking a move on this, the G20 countries. Um, and this is a continuation of a trend where G7 countries are leading the conversation. Very recently, uh, the G7 meeting of finance ministers confirmed uh, to agree moving ahead on global minimum corporate tax, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of other movements where the G7 is taking a lead. Do you feel that smaller nations like us, like ours, should be taking a greater uh, role in terms of driving this conversation forward? Where do we stack up when it comes to us versus G7, for instance, or us versus the big economies? Do you feel that we need to coalesce amongst each other and drive this conversation further, more aggressive even? Well, uh, Ibrahim, naturally, uh, the G7 countries, uh, they have uh, the capacity uh, can, and capability um, to be able to actually drive uh, some of these major uh, initiatives, uh, given their advanced stage. Or in the development of the economy. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the world will take a back seat. Uh, and you, you mentioned about the commitment towards net zero, for example. Uh, based on the last count, um, I remember there's some 127 countries uh, you know, beyond the G7 uh, that have committed uh, towards uh, net zero. And that represents about 38% of the uh, global economy uh, that's committed to uh, global net zero by 2050. Uh, and there's another, uh, I think, 32% uh, uh, or so uh, that's committed uh, towards global net zero by uh, 2060. Um, so my view is that, uh, yes, it's okay that the G7 countries uh, have taken the lead given the advanced stage of their economic development, uh, their wealth and so on, uh, but uh, the rest of the world uh, will play their part, their part too. There seems to be a lot of uh, listed companies uh, in Malaysia uh, that is uh, taking some pride uh, in terms of how they disclose uh, their financial reporting, particularly when it comes to highlighting uh, their efforts on sustainability, on uh, net zero uh, uh, carbon emission, or uh, even low carbon economy. Um, one such company that I can mention top of my, my mind is HSBC Amana, uh, very recently doing the same thing amongst others. Uh, do you feel that uh, the incentive uh, for uh, the companies uh, in Malaysia, particularly listed companies, can be further enhanced in order for them to uh, embrace this even further? Uh, where do you see uh, regulators come in 
and incentivizing these companies to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of embracing ESG practices? Well, my view is actually, I don't think you need incentives per se uh, for them to move towards uh, sustainability uh, because at the end of the day, uh, it's a global movement and for which mm. if they do not uh, participate in it, uh, they will be left behind. Uh, so it's very clear. Uh, if you look at uh, the equity investors, the fund managers, for example, um, they have made a clear commitment that they will not be investing in companies that ignore ESG considerations in their business. Uh, and likewise, uh, financial institutions um, have also made the commitment that they will not fund uh, companies uh, that ignore ESG uh, considerations in their business. Uh, so what that means is uh, for any company, uh, listed or otherwise, that chose to ignore sustainability considerations, uh, the environmental, social and governance considerations in their business activities, uh, they're not going to get uh, any equity funding. They're not going to get any uh, debt financing. Um, and they're also not going to get uh, many people buying their products too because the consumers are now demanding uh, that companies uh, practice uh, sustainability uh, in producing the products. And uh, on the last part, you're also not going to get the human capital necessary um, to run your business because uh, the many people nowadays, uh, especially the younger generation, uh, they would only want to join companies that look after the environment, uh, that care for the people and uh, that have good governance. Uh, the uh, Joint Committee for Climate Change or JC3 has placed a theme called finance for change. And when we talk about finance for change, I can't help but think how do we break out from this notion of you know, uh, uh, banks financing businesses uh, that is uh, having a proven track record of uh, repayment, clear um, asset uh, and liability uh, statements. Um, and, you know, the world of um, VCs and PEs or the venture capitalists, uh, they have a clear idea of what the matrices are when it comes to financing entrepreneurs moving forward. Uh, but when, when we talk about finance for change per se, do we, if we really want change, do you feel that the traditional um, financial institutions really need to embrace how they want to finance um, businesses and entrepreneurs that really embrace uh, developing solutions for climate change? A solar uh, manufacturer, for instance, an electric car manufacturer, when they go to a bank, do they still need to uh, uh, fulfill old ways of, uh, of, uh, of uh, going concern, for instance? Do you feel that, you know, it's a post-pandemic world, we really have to rethink how we do things, and at the same time, of course, managing our risk, obviously, but at the same time, try to see where these entrepreneurs are coming from, where these businesses are coming from, and try to truly finance for change? Well, um it's important for all of us to remember uh, the basic functioning of uh, fund managers and uh, of the financial institutions. Now, uh, you know, their role is uh, mobilize funds, uh, surplus funds, uh, into uh, productive sectors of the economy and into viable businesses. Uh, and uh, nowadays, into uh, more sustainable businesses. So by very nature, uh, they're actually fulfilling their role. Now, in the past, um, there may not have been enough uh, considerations uh, on the sustainability elements, uh, but now that's actually very much high on the agenda. Uh, now, it is very important uh, for uh, the financial institutions, for the fund managers, when they invest, naturally they will have to look into the viability and the feasibility of uh, the uh, projects and, and the companies and the businesses uh, that they are funding, because without viability and sustainability, and uh, feasibility, uh, naturally, uh, they will not be getting the returns uh, necessary, uh, again, to give back uh, to uh, the providers of the funds uh, in the first place. Um, now, uh, that doesn't mean uh, that um, they will be irrespons irresponsible uh, and just looking at the financial uh, considerations. So uh, it's looking at both uh, sustainability uh, and uh, financial considerations too, because if it's not viable, uh, it will end up with uh, the financial institutions and the fund managers losing money. And I don't think that's sustainable uh, in itself. Um, and speaking of um, 
you know, the, the green businesses that uh, you mentioned, uh, electric vehicles and so on. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot of money that's gone into uh, these businesses. Uh, naturally, for any new ventures, uh, that will require a lot more of the risk capital. So this is where uh, you have your venture capitalists uh, going in um, and private equity firms going in because they are able to absorb uh, higher risk compared to your traditional uh, debt uh, funding. But naturally, uh, once the technology is proven, uh, then the, um, uh, the uh, low risk financiers uh, will then be able to actually uh, come in and, and provide that additional financing required to scale up uh, the business if you like. Um, that's really, so you're going to be a speaker at the Finance for Change conference. Uh, what would be some of your uh, thoughts going into the uh, event? Uh, what would be some of your personal wishes um, in order for you to see this truly uh, success, uh, successful event? Well, uh, the event will be held over two and a half days. Um, so on 23rd and 24th, um, so you will have, uh, you know, uh, this will be uh, emphasis more on fresh institutions. Um, and uh, you have, uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, people like uh, the Benegra governor and the chairman of the Securities Commission uh, will be speaking on uh, the first and second day, respectively. Uh, you have uh, the Minister of Finance uh, doing the closing plenary uh, on the second day. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the highlights will be uh, Sir David Attenborough, um, the conservationist and uh, naturalist uh, who will be providing the big picture on climate change and so on. Uh, on my part, um, I'll be delivering the keynote address on the third day, um, and that will be very much suitable for all the corporate sector. So the, the idea will be to encourage uh, more and more uh, corporate sector to come on board uh, the sustainable uh, sustainability journey. Uh, and the idea will be uh, there's a lot of advocacy uh, and encouraging them, uh, not just uh, about what to do, but how um, to do it as well. Um, and, and to me, uh, to be very granular about how and what role they can play uh, to support uh, Malaysia uh, in its movement towards uh, net zero. And uh, speaking of net zero, obviously, uh, we will also have, uh, among others, the uh, Secretary General uh, for the Ministry of uh, Environment and Water, uh, Dr. Sri uh, Zen Yu Jiang, uh, will also be speaking at the uh, conference. So uh, I do hope that um, everyone uh, will find time to participate um, and listen in to this conference. Tan Sri, the final few questions I have for you is actually a plea towards the corporates. Um, based on the interviews that I've done um, in, on this show, uh, it seems like the the mood is it's uh, either or, either to remain going concerned, particularly in a tough environment uh, post pandemic, uh, and try to focus and hunker down, you know, do uh, whatever that is needed to come out of this pandemic uh, unscathed or at least uh, you know bearable, uh, because they do have a lot of uh, businesses that are suffering because of the pandemic, or embrace change, embrace uh, ESG practices. Uh, um, try to be more sustainable. And, and when I tell them that why must it be an either or kind of argument, uh, they can't seem to see the financial viability of embracing ESG practices with, at the same time, with being productivity uh, or being productive. Where do you stand on this? Is it an either or question or do you think that uh, it's one and the same? In fact, uh, it's crucially needed uh, embracing ESG means uh, going concern is uh, being upheld. You are right, Brahim. Uh, they are not mutually exclusive. Uh, so uh, in the first place, look at what we are going through now uh, is as a result of first ignoring the environmental considerations and uh, from a risk management side too. Um, and you see how the zoonotic diseases um, have uh, emerged, uh, jumping from, uh, from animal to human. Uh, and uh, we, we are still grappling with it, and but I, I think uh, Alhamdulillah and Inshallah, uh, with the vaccination rate increasing, uh, we'll be able uh, to come out of it. But along the way, uh, you will see that the businesses that uh, suffered most have been those that did not look at the, um, the sustainability uh, element uh, in their business operations. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of looking at the, their supply chain, 
multiple sourcing uh, diversification um, of uh, both uh, their supplies and uh, their uh, sale of their eventual products, uh, for example. Uh, and I think this is where uh, it is important for companies to take into account the sustainability elements. Uh, again, the three elements of environmental, social, and uh, governance uh, into their business, because if they don't do that, they will not get the equity financing, they will not get the debt financing, they will not get the human capital that they need um, to run the business, and they will not get the um, consumers uh, buying their products if they choose to ignore uh, ESG. Um, so my view is actually is inevitable, uh, but what we need uh, is to truly uh, advocate and enhance the level of comprehension uh, among corporates. Um, so why are we doing this and how uh, we uh, can do this? Uh, and when everyone starts to contribute, uh, and I think inshallah, uh, we'll uh, move towards a much better environment uh, and towards a more sustainable, uh, inclusive um, uh, society uh, and economy if like. Yeah, thank you, Sanstri. Uh, that was Sanstri Abu and Omar, who's the chairman, Dalin from the UK. Um, please do uh, check out JC3 conference that is happening on the uh, 23rd to 25th of June. It's happening in a few weeks' time, I suppose. Um, if you've missed any part of this conversation, just head on to astroawani.com. Look for Notepad there. Look, at, look also look out for Bursa Malaysia. Look out for JC3, um, and there are plenty of conversations like this that can be found there. Also, you can uh, let us know what you think about the show. Uh, just hit us up uh, using hashtag Awani News on all our social sites. Until then, thanks very much for watching uh, and catch you in the next one.